Riding down Highway 61 Sides of the roads all lined with fields Nothing but sunset in the windshield Feel it as soon as I ride into town This is where I go Brad Chapel back with you. We're at the Spring Show at Grizzly Jig 2024. It's going to be a great event. Can't wait to get everything going this weekend. But I've got two legends next to me in my mind. On the right side of me, Mr. John Mayo. Tell us a little bit about you, John. Uh, born and raised right in North Mississippi in Water Valley, Mississippi. Uh, about 10 minutes from Enid Lake. Grew up fishing the Big Four all my life. I have no doubt about that. <laughs> John Harrison. I was born and raised right here in Mississippi. Uh, I live in Calhoun City, Mississippi, and I've been fishing these lakes all my life. I remember John telling me one time that he was crappie fishing in diapers. <laughs> it's been a long time ago. I won't go back that far. I barely <laughs> can't remember it. You know, the subject line that I wanted to got these two guys and I thought about is, you know, catching crappie during the spawn, waiting. And I know both you guys really love this technique. And we want to get somebody some good ideas and get them the basics of how do you go out and what are you looking for whenever you're thinking about going wade fishing. And, you know, the core lakes, when I think of wading, those just are the perfect wading scenario lakes. And kind of tell us about both the lakes that you are, are the lakes you're guiding at and which ones you're both of you guiding at. Well, <clears throat> we guide on Grenada and Enid and Sardis. And, you know, what we look for is, warm weather and, and high water for wading uh you know if it if like i'll use grenada for example if it's if it's not over 215 it's not up in the structure enough that you know you could i mean you can wade but you're gonna be in a in a lot of soft mud and you're gonna have to do a lot of walking to fish just some stump fields or trash piles that you know the debris that's piled up along the river's edge and those drifts but if the water gets high it's really really easy to wade i mean you can you can wade all day you won't have no mud on your feet hmm. uh the higher the water the better it's in a lot of brush and, and when the water starts warming you know uh, those old males they're going far as they can go back in the woods and you know there's no way you can get to them in a boat i mean you're gonna have to find your way to the bank get out take you up i mean we we like using 10 foot 11 foot jig poles and maybe a little heavier line say 10 12 pound test line and we like getting in them bushes with them. You know, when you're looking at, and I've seen Grenada and in it as well in the springtime, and you look at it and you're like, man, that just looks like a briar thicket over there. And, you know, and then some of it, you'll see patches of woods and different things. What are the some of the key areas that you would say that right there to me looks like a spot that I need to put some waders on and go to? Cypress tree. Cypress tree. Yeah, if I'm walking through a thicket and I see a cypress tree, I got to remember one thing. They may not be a right around that tree, but those cypresses, you know, the bigger the cypress, they got knees. Right. You know, and them crappie love a cypress knee. And if you've ever seen a big cypress tree in the lake bottom, when it's dry, it'll have sometimes 50, 75 knees, you know, 12, 15 foot out from it. When those males go, they, they, they find that cypress and they find those knees. And, you know, once you catch one or two, you can, you can bet there's some more there. You know, that's just one of the things. And, you know, my, my second choice would be, <clears throat> we call them ironwoods. A lot of people call them old buck brush, but if you take, you know, uh, one of those ironwoods and once that water goes off of them and on them and off, they tend to fall over, all right? And you gotta pull you. And when you see one of them over in about thigh deep water or waist deep water, 
you better believe that male he's found that you know sometimes you might but you don't get them all out but they might get you know eight or ten in one old big ironwood bush where you got to pull your line up to the tip stick it in there and feed it down you know and yeah he's gonna hit it about four inches under the water going down you're gonna lose about half of them but that's some of the things maybe in around the roots that we look for you know when we're wading john mayo you might have the same <laughs> answer as i just john gave us here but kind of what's your ideal scenario when you're looking at some of these thickets or, or what are some things that kind of jump out to you that says, hey, I need to put them waders on right now? One of the biggest things I look for when wading, I remember where the creeks and depressions are at. These crappie use the creeks and depressions just like highways. So that's going to be an area that I'm going to start looking. Uh, one of my big things that I truly like is vines. Vines. Lots of vines. No doubt about that. Uh, if, you, if you go through an area... When you look up in the woods and there's just clean trees, no vines, briars, anything like that, it's usually not a very good place. Uh, thicker, if it looks like a place you want to rabbit hunt, that's where you need to be crop. Mr. Cottontail probably lived there at one time. Yes, that crop is going to be in there. And Cottontail moved out and the Cottonmouth moved in. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, when we talk about, you know, waiting, somebody that's never heard this terminology before what is actually way what are you doing when you're are you getting out there in just blue jeans or what are the basics of equipment as far as waiting goes well you need pair wise even you need to get you a good pair of waders i'm not saying an old thick pair you know because the water's going to be you know in the 50s and above i mean i have waited in you know my pants and shoes before but i really didn't care how cold yeah. i got you know i wanted to fish so you know as maybe at the end of march or something on warm days or something if it's up in the 60s you could do that but you need a good pair of waders you know it don't have to be a you know an expensive pair uh you need your pair of waders and uh, a good jig pole what Put about you, when you what are you doing with the fish that's another you thing <clears throat> you know i used to I, i'd just take a stringer you know but now the best thing to have is get you go to walmart somewhere and get you a chain stringer where you can snap that chain stringer on your side uh, it'll hold eight about eight fish, but you know, I mean, that's you can just snap them on there and keep it, you know, drop it in the water, and you can drag that chain stringer, and it's, it's just a lot more, you know, easier to do that way than it is untying, because most time if I untie, I'm gonna drop him before I get yeah. him strung back up, and time you, I'm gonna hurry up and catch another one. So that's just killing a lot of time for me to untie and tie back up. I wanna hook him on and get back mm -hmm. to fishing quick as I can. <laughs> John, what kind of waders are you using? I use Drake. Uh, I think John and I both use Drake yeah. waders, and uh, you know they're really good. I would suggest getting a brush tough or a tough canvas material because, like John said, you're going to be wading through briars, uh, cypress knees. So, don't need a real thick neoprene wader so much as a duck hunting wader, but you do need a durable wader. Uh, you know, so Drake's been a really good. They're they're you know right there in Mississippi, great company, and uh, you know been wearing them for years, but. Uh, I know another thing. I remember John saying on the we, we did a podcast a couple of years ago, and I really didn't think about it because I'm not a big waiter. Just Lake Washington, I tried waiting one time, and let me tell you what, that bottom right there is too soft. It's because the water stays the same level, and it's it's rotten. That ground's rotten. But the the three lakes like Sardis, and in Grenada, it's winter drawdown comes. That that ground stays out of the water november december january it stays out of the water three months out of a year and 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 when it gets high it's just firm ground i mean it's just as solid as concrete you can you know out to waste or, but if you get in a place that maybe an old slough that's kept water all summer year round or an old spring it's going to be soft i never hardly have much luck in that you know in that hmm. unless you find some old bull grass or something most of the time, it's, you got to stay in that thigh deep, knee deep water, and that ground is hard as a brick. You know, you're not going. And and a lot of times, people take them a stick just to keep their balance and walk yeah. along, and that's okay too. You know, uh, I do that myself from time to time when I get tired of walking. But uh, you know, other but far as being in any kind of mud or it being, it, it's really enjoyable. It it really is. It's it, it's I, I love it. It's kind of like a hand to hand combat there going yeah. down in it. Yeah, and it is. Yeah. <laughs> it really is. I mean, I'm not saying you wouldn't step in a, you know, a, a beaver hole or a, a, a rut, you know, if you run an old, run an old road bed or something, you might step in a rut, and slip off in it or something. But, you know, unless you step off in a creek, you ain't going. I know what, like I said, I remember you telling us about wearing a belt. Belt. All right, that's another thing. When you, anytime you're, you're uh, 
you know, you're waiting for safety purposes. It's, it's always good to put you a belt right here and pull it tight, you know, about as tight, pretty taut, you know, and, mm -hmm. and put it on. Because if you happen to slip or you make a little, you know, go down, all you're going to get wet, it ain't going to fill your waders up. Right. And once you fill them waders up, it ain't no coming up because you got straps on. You know, when them waders get full of water, you ain't coming up. So if you just go down, you know, and you got that belt around you, you just get a little wet right here. You're dry from here all the way down. You're still good to go. If you like me, you might have a gallon or two, but if you fill it all the way, yeah, if you'll have yeah, five or six gallons. He ain't coming up. <laughs> yeah, I, no. That is a very safety yeah, part yeah, of yeah, it, I would a, think. Yeah, I, that, I, would, I would say don't go without a pair of good waders and, a, and, a, and take you an old belt, any kind of old belt, and put around you up high, high as you can get it around you to feel comfortable and, and keep that belt kind of tight, you know. And any time... A lot, and I do this a lot, John too. We we do this a lot, guiding. You'll fish this area out, and and you you know you don't pull your boat up on the bank. You jump in it, you take off. You're not thinking. You know, if you hit a stump or anything, you know them waders. When that waiter fills up, you're going to the bottom. You're not coming up. I don't care. I go to swimmer yard. So here's one thing to keep in mind: when you get in that boat, take your straps. Just flip both your just flip both straps off. That waiter fills up, it, your boot comes off. Yeah, you're good to go. You know, that's just, that's just probably really key. I yeah, mean, that, yeah, just safety remember goes. That, that safety goes. Uh, undo them straps of them waders. I mean, like I said, I've tried in in Washington. I haven't. I don't know if I ever tried in Barnett, just because of the amount of uh, big lizards that we got down there. <laughs> yeah. So I haven't they got tried, teeth. They, they got a lot of teeth. Too and, many for me. Yeah. I just hadn't been brave enough, and I'm sure some guys have tried it down there, but I have not tried it down there. But I did try it at Washington, and literally it was just... It's terrible. I went to the alligator Ooh. hole one time, and, and I, I went back from here to that door about 20 feet, and I caught some fish. <laughs> yeah. And I looked back at my boat, I thought I'd been a mile. I, I couldn't hardly... I didn't know if I was going to get back to it, but the, I'd step, and the water was knee-deep, and it just... If I stood there, it, it just keep going and going and going, and bubbles coming up. And I'd be at my waist, and I'd... I like not never got out. I said I'm through with that. Yeah, it's a, so it's not really an ideal technique for every lake. No, not every lake. No, <laughs> but no. you know, for these, it it's just fits it perfect. Yeah. And and I'm sure there's other lakes around the country. You know that it's the same way. I know. Right when I got into crappie fishing, we went up to Grenada, Grenada Lake, and I'm gonna say mid April to say, and we're like, what in the world are these guys doing <laughs> over in these bushes, yeah. walking around? And you know, the more you watch people, and you're like. Well, they don't have shotguns, so they're, they're not shooting, and they're holding jig poles, yeah. so they're crappie fishing. But even poles, and I know both of you guys, I know John Mayo's got a pole right here next to him. I do. He, he, he said he wasn't coming in here without a pole. That's right. This is my favorite. Uh, it's a B&M 10-foot tree thumper. Uh, that's my favorite rod by far to use. 10-foot seems to be the best for me, uh, just like a good 10-pound monofilament. And... Uh, you know, far as baits go, you know, we fish muddy water in the spring, so uh, crappie magnet, slab magnet, orange and chartreuse. Or, I know that's Harrison's color right there. Or hey, lime green. I knife? know that's I, Harrison's I color right there. That. I've seen it before. <laughs> you know, when you're talking about waiting, that's really the only two colors you need. Mm -hmm. You know, until later on in April, if the water stays up in the woods, it will real, get real clear. Yeah. And until it really clears up, that's right there is all you need. You know, and John touched on it before as well, and then as far as explaining, holding that line with one hand and pulling it and dropping it down, what, do you, what is the intent of doing that and how well, are you doing it? Well, you know, you got that bush there. How am I going to get in there? You know, you got two foot of line. You just I, can't drop it down. I, I can't get over the top of it. I can't go under it. I know them fish is in that bush. I just reach and get my line, hold it in this right hand. I'm right-handed. I pull it just right to the tip. You can't get too rough with them, you know. Those tips, I mean, they're they, they're pretty sensitive. I mean, you, if you're careful with them, you're all right. But yeah. you don't just get, you know, too rough. But I go in anywhere I want to go in that tree with that jig. I mean, if it's a spot no bigger than that, and I let that, I start feeding it down. And you can expect about four inches there. That male, mm -hmm. he's coming to get it. He ain't wanting it in there. If he sees it, he's going to get it. Sometimes you can get it all the way down before he hits it. Most time you're going to jerk, get about a half set on him and just pull him, pull him back. Will they strike again if they miss it? Yeah, they, they, they don't. Yeah, they don't they, care? No, nah, they mad. They don't want it in there. You know, that that's their home and they don't want it in there. But, you know, it just I just pull him out of there. Once you get him to the top, you know, you can drag him on out. When he hits that open water, he's going to run. But 
Other than that, he, you pretty much drag him on out of there. And I think of, you know, and I've said it probably no telling how many times through the, the last four or five years on Crappie Connection, but when you're talking about jigging, how are you presenting this baits or your baits to crappie down in these dark, thick spots? Well, you don't have to really do a lot of jigging when you're going in there. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, when, once he sees it coming, he's coming. I, I just try to give it, you know, one little twitch and hold it still. Most time if he's in there, you ain't gonna have to wait long. He, he's coming to get you. Yeah, he'll let you know. He'll let you, you know. You if ain't got to wonder if there's so one. So you in ain't got to sit there for three or four minutes and no, 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 one no, little no, no, spot no, or no, anything. No, if I fish, if I two or three dips, you know, four or five seconds, he ain't bit it. I'm gonna pull it out. I'm gonna go a foot over, two foot over. I'm gonna fish that whole top, you know, because I. So you're saying no more than probably ten to fifteen seconds. To move yeah, to another, that's a long. Fifteen little... seconds is a long time, really, when it's sitting in there. You know, I mean, unless it's just now, if it's super cold. And I would say this, early in the morning, everybody's anxious to go because, you know, we caught them yesterday evening, and I mean, yeah. they was tearing it up in that treetop. I go there this morning. Well, you wasn't thinking that yesterday when you left, that sun was out, and that water done warmed up to 61. And this morning, this may be 57 or 56. It's yeah. a little colder. He may be in there. He don't bite it. You know, he ain't as active as, as he was. You know, when, when that water was warm, He he's mad. But, you know, he's so just, in general, dude, would you say that the – Afternoons better to wade fish than in the morning. In the early, in early March, I would say your afternoons are better. Yeah. And as it progresses, does it change up to better bite in the morning compared to the afternoon? Well, or? after that water gets, you know, the nights don't get down to where it cools that water off so much. You know, uh, later on in March, mid March on twentieth on, the night stays warm. You know, and mild. It don't necessarily get that water cold. You can still about to catch them early in the mornings. You know. What about even like, and I know I see some reels right here that uh, Mr. Mayo has, but tell us why would you use this kind of reel compared to like a spinning reel on, on a, a tree thump or any other pole? Well, this is my favorite reel, the little ultralight reel by B&M. And really, you just want something to hold the line that's True. super compact because you're literally wading through a thicket. Mm -hmm. And when I say a thicket, I'm talking about briars, honeysuckle. Mr. Cotton tail. That's right. Don't tell how many times I've been walking through there. My line, hang on, look back, and I got three foot of line back here. You know, yeah. I and you know, I got to reel it back up and stop and pull it off. This, you know, it's it's a little aggravating if you. Ain't, but like John said, it. You know, we use those light reels. I mean, you just need something to hold your line there. You don't. You know, and also, you know, the longer you hold that pole. You know, you don't want no heavy reel on there. You, you ain't gonna take no 16 footer out no. there. No, <laughs> no, no, no. And I, and I, I tell you, uh, Captain Coleman uh, makes a, a B and M's got a eight and nine foot, and I have been in thickets in Grenada when it was like the water was 229, 230. It it was a like sure enough a rabbit couldn't get through it. Mm -hmm. it and I, and you couldn't reason I went in there because nobody else would. You know, you can't get through there. But I would break that eight foot pole down. You only got four foot. Put it under my arm, and I'd walk because I knew what I was looking for. And those little ironwoods wouldn't be that big. Well, there wasn't no fish in them. But I'd spot me a stump, a little rotten stump about that big around in, in there. And I'd go straight to that stump or one little cypress tree, just, you know, just one something different than all that green stuff. I'm sure they was in it, but, I mean, you might fish a week before you, you know, found them. I'd go to that one spot, put my pole together, stick it over, I'd catch me about two, on to the next one. Mm -hmm. And, and I'd just walk and walk and walk. I mean, they wasn't that far apart, but, I mean, you had to duck and walk and pull, you know. It was just that thick getting through there. You had to push them. It was, it was a little tough, but you about guaranteed you was going to catch them when you went through there. I want you, both of you guys, and we all have these days that you, you just will never forget when it comes to, you know, crappie fishing. Do you have a particular day that you can recall that you went out and kind of tell us some of the details, a storyline? Let's give a, a little story of when you've been out on a wading fishing day and you you trying to get us put in jail, ain't you? <laughs> well, <I'm laughs> well, definitely not. No. I, I got one story from last year, but I, and if I tell it and they hear it, I'm fixing to get in so much trouble. Uh oh. Huh. Well, nobody hear it, but the guys listening on Crossing. That's, that's it. That's it. He Nobody's gonna the, listen. He's not recording this. No, definitely so, not. I, I took one of my buddies, uh, uh, a Hispanic Savano, and I took another buddy of mine, uh, Josh. Took him wading, put in South Graysport. It's got a couple places, you know. If you go all the way to the back, people know about it. But I had a yeah. couple places in there around Old Horse Trough, and 
I knew I could wade. It's water. It looks deep, but it's not. Mm-hmm. So I go in there. I tie my boat up. It's I, I stick my pole down. It's I test it. I, it's just right, boys. We jump out, and which I didn't tell them, but. I got over on this left side, and they got on the right because it was some pretty cypress there. I wasn't worried about them cypress. And it was a little swag in those cypress, and I knew it was there. And about 60 yards up there, it dead-ended. And right where it dead-ended was some big old sweet gums, and every one of them had vines just hanging, just like Mate John was talking about, just hanging. I kind of stayed up with them, and they was fishing hard, and they missed one, and I caught one. And we get on down, and they kind of veer off to the right, and I ain't saying nothing, you know. <laughs> I got over That's there. That's nice. <laughs> I got over there, and them vines, and I'm telling you, I it was as, just as fast. Of course, they was it was that much water differential, and they had come out and followed that little, little ditch, ditch yeah. just as far as they could go, and I knew right where it did end it. I've been there a hundred times. They was in there as thick as fleas. I, I, I was catching them. I don't how I many I had caught. I was throwing them back, catching them, yeah. and I caught my limit. And they couldn't get over there fast enough. I mean, they. It, oh. it was one of them times. It was. It was fast. That would be me. I'd be on the they wrong still spot. Talk, they still talk. They They still talk about it today. They said I had a different jig than I than mm-hmm. I gave them. Of course, they had their own jigs, but it's what I gave them. I said I didn't give you nothing, you know. But, <laughs> right. but, but uh, it was a, it was a jig, and he done caught them all behind when he's in front of us. And I, I'm telling you, I, I I know I caught 25 or 30 just as fast. Everywhere I stuck my hook, it didn't matter. It was just that many males and went right there and stopped. Didn't matter. Then I'd put your jig around nothing, just drag it. And I mean, it was just like that everywhere you go. But I kind of stuck out on me. <laughs> Mayo, you got one that comes to my I see you laughing already. So it's got to be funny. I do. This has been back when limit was 30 mm-hmm. there on the big four. This has been many years ago, but uh, water came way up. We had coffee beans, so probably been 15 years ago. That was back in the good old days. Good and old uh, I was between the third and fourth break on Enid Lake, normal spring, and uh, we were fishing stump field out there. You know, had all this grass. We ain't never seen that stuff before. You know, we didn't, we didn't know fish yeah. would get up in that stuff. So about 9 o'clock, I guess, I eased over. There's a couple stumps out away from everything else. Nobody had fished, so I eased over there. And I stood up in the boat, and I looked down in the water, clump of that coffee bean, and I see a flash. Really didn't know what it was. And I look, another clump, and I see another flash. Well, I just grab my old jig pole. You know, I'm just an old pair of blue jeans and all. And I drop a jig over in them coffee beans, and one nails it. And I catch it and drop it back in there. I look around, everybody's about 50 yards from me. I ease up there and tie my boat up, and I ease out the front of that boat. That's back. Cell phone, I had, probably had a flip phone back then. Or a bag phone. I uh, wasn't that long ago. <laughs> but uh, I stayed over about 30, 45 minutes, and I hear a boat coming. It's my cousin. And uh, he said, you've been over here a while. What you been doing? Nothing. <laughs> and uh, We're just killing time. That was about 9 o'clock that morning. We come off the lake about 8 o'clock that night. And when I say... Got them? Yes, sir. We fished that one spot for three days, and I've never seen, it was a swag, just like we always talk, in between those two breaks, and, it, and the coffee beans had grown in there. I'll probably never see it again in my lifetime, but you talk about a bunch of good old boys having a good time. Uh, I mean, just some of the funnest fishing, there's no brush, just, just the vine, you yeah. know, the old coffee beans. I've never seen anything like it. And that's that's by far the best waiting I've ever seen in my life. It's when we had the coffee beans. Oh yeah. I, I've seen it on Grenada where it, you just take What is it what does the coffee bean look like? I'm they'll grow eight, ten foot tall, just an old weed, you know, that when it's like a summertime it's dry, it's just an old bean weed, you know. You never seen them in Grenada? Yeah, but uh, I'm thinking somebody that don't know what in the world we're talking about here. It's just an old weed that sticks a lot tall up, you know. It's green and then it it is real thick. And let me tell you, crappie love them. It's just, it's, it's unbelievable how they, I, I wish they'd come back. I mean, in the, in, in spots, you know, that, that there's places in little swags that they'll grow in Grenada, but not yeah. not like they used to when that water stayed low in the summer. If you get you a low summer, you know, and they grow up, I, I, I've, it's unbelievable how you can catch them. And you can't catch them all out. I mean, it's, and they love it. I mean, they just thrive in it, and it's good for shad and everything. But like John's talking about, if you, Found you a patch of coffee weeds. I've trolled over them, just just set still with single jigs, and 
I mean, you could males was just as I mean, you couldn't. I mean, it was just fast as you could grab them poles. If you moved a foot this way or two foot this way, they was just thick as fleas. You know, just I mean, it was just that many. But if you could, you know, if it was two foot deep and it went to three foot deep and a little impression, there they are. Every one in the lake seemed like it's right there. There ain't no catching them out. They just you could wade coming. that stuff for a mile, and you'd catch one here and one there. And we would take two or three boats and drop people off and wade from boat to boat. And then all of a sudden, you could get in a 20-foot square. You couldn't catch them all. Like little bees in there. I mean, it, it's like I've never seen them bed up. You know, like you've always heard brim bedding. Yeah. That's the only time I've seen crappie just get that thick. Uh, I got one more question in a second. But if you're watching right now, you had not hit the subscribe button yet for us. Go ahead and hit, hit subscribe. Hit some thumbs up. Perfect time right now as you're watching and I'm giving these guys a little break to think a minute and rest. But go ahead and hit that thumbs up for me. Appreciate everybody as well. Both these guys are great buddies of mine and great fishermen as well. So definitely thank them again for coming on here. But, you know, and I'm going to get a tip from you at the end of the show. I didn't tell you all that when I asked you all to come on this wedding part, but I'm going to get a tip from you at the end separately. But, you know, when you think about this time frame and – there's a particular time that you really weighed and that's just a short window it's not something you can do in the fall necessarily is it it's just during the spawn hardcore but what would be the your favorite month to wade fish if you had to pick one for the core lakes i would pick from the 15th day of march to the first day <laughs> of april that'd be my favorite. oh that that's short mm -hmm. That'd be my prime time, but I, I, I could back it up. See, all these fish don't go to the bank at the same time. They, mm -hmm. they go to the upper end of this lake, all right? All right? That's where they start. As time progresses, you know, the water's colder the further you go down into deeper water. They tend to, you know, when they start playing out, you go down the lake you a little, a little bit, bit further Yeah, down. go down the lake maybe, uh, and you start catching them here. Well, as they play out here, you work your way on toward that dam. Uh, I've caught them as, I mean, I have started catching them the first week of April and catch them in Grenada all the way to May. Mm -hmm. I caught them in the first week of May. And I, got, I was telling Tim Huffman a while ago, I caught them wading in waist-deep water, and, and not as many, and they tend to start getting smaller. The, the later you get into that spawn, you start catching a lot of little males, 10 inches. You know, you might catch 15 or 20 by a cypress tree and keep one. Yeah. You know, it's just a... The, the first ones you catch is your best ones. The first ones that comes are the best ones, and the later it gets, the smaller they get. Uh, I mean, you just, you might catch a, you know, John can tell you, you go to Indian sometime, you might catch a hundred, literally, and, and keep 15. Right. Here, you know, I, I mean, I, I've been to Sardis even last year and just catch them and catch them and catch them and catch them all day long, and you got 14, of, you know, you might get you a limit, 15. Do you think these fish kind of come in and I know you said the waves. Do you think they just kind of filter in all together or, you know, singles? Have you ever come back and fished a spot, you know, 10 minutes later, come back and there's fish in this area? I know I, Washington, in the beginning when we would really fish a lot of the cypress trees, you know, you might come around there and fish it real good. And yeah. 20 minutes later, all of a sudden, they're like, they appeared. And, and I seen a gentleman one time and he told me that he thought these fish kind of come in little waves. They'd go in. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. Have you noticed that? Well, well, you know, in a, and I know they do it in the springtime, but you know, in the summer when we used to fish off the bridges, a lot. You'd see a wave come through. Everybody pulling up fish. Everybody, far as you could see. It lasts five minutes, ten minutes, and stop. Nobody catching nothing. Thirty minutes, nothing. You look down through. All of a sudden, here it starts again. You know. Well, I, I've been waiting, and I'd go through a spot. And I thought. I didn't catch nut, and I'd come back fishing a little slower, and I'd catch them. I thought, well, I was fishing too fast, but I believe those fish, those males move in, they move out. You know, they mm -hmm. move in and they move out. You catch them, you know. And I've talked to people, and they say, well, we caught them, you know, in there yesterday. And I think, well, I was in there yesterday morning, or you You're know, right. a certain time. You know, I went in there at ten o'clock, and they wasn't in there, they hadn't moved in there yet. But they do. I believe that. Yeah, I, I do. I, that's what I kind of thought when I think of weight fishing that you might be in an area and this the perfect ingredients yeah and that wave just hadn't come through at right. that particular yeah. time yet yeah that's true I, I believe in that sure do i come believe on. it you know they 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 move in and they move out 
you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you ain't the only one that fished that cypress tree. He, you know, Joe or Bill, he caught one, Bob caught one, and Larry caught five, and then you come along and caught four, and you now that was all of them. And then, you know, it just they just keep going in there, you know. They just, I believe that. It, all of them just don't move at one no, time. No, and no, 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 they, they, they keep going. You, you'll see people catch a few, and then some won't, you know, and then they'll come back by there and catch it. They just, they move it in and out. If you, if you, I got certain places that I, I catch me two or three, and I know that's all that's there. I leave it. I go back there a few minutes later. I catch me one or two more. I walk off. You go back by there, drop in there. Ma'am, you done caught you another. They, they just coming in and out, in and out of there. That's what I kind of figure when it comes to wading too. That it's kind and, of like just and, and maybe so many people, and you know, and when you after about two weeks of people wading a thicket, you're gonna walk in boot tracks. It's just so many. But and I believe that you know when that first fish is caught or maybe that second one, you know they they know they may the they gonna scoot up. off over here and then they are gonna come back or something to that prime time little yeah. nest area. Yeah, I guess. yeah. yeah to I'm, I'm gonna tell you something that I've noticed and John and I've waited together and you, you can really tell people that's done this all their life and it, probably one of the best tips I can give on wading and I've seen him do it never said anything to him he knows I do it uh -oh. but we fish out of a John boat you know just old tiller no like we don't have any electronic yeah. we got old beaver stick or uh, you know a hole handle to see how deep it is <laughs> right. so, you know it's about as basic of fishing but when we're running those boats we keep our hands in the water when we're waiting, sure. we keep our hands in the water. Luke warm. And you'll be going down through there. You'll, you'll hit that cold patch of water, and then all of a sudden, it feels, you know. A little bit warm. A little warm. Mm -hmm. Like you wash your face. You know, it's warm water. It makes a big difference. You can start waiting, and, uh, you know, I think sunlight penetrates through the woods, you know, different areas. And the areas that warm up first, uh, one of the tricks that I've learned, uh, sand banks you know on Grenada and Enid will warm up faster than the mud banks makes sense oh uh, you know it's a lot to it uh we ain't gonna give all the secrets away <laughs> I'm gonna twist your arm though <laughs> well he but, gave you a good point there anytime I get out waiting I feel like cool I put my hand in that water it's cold I don't have much faith but I get out of that boat I put that hand in that water and it feels like that warm bath water I'm finna catch me some, so I'm worried hmm. through there. Uh, and another, th I'm gonna give you this little tip. Anytime you get out, and you know in these lakes, you hear something sloshing, I go straight to it. Because them carp have found that warm water, you know, and that's the warmest water, they're getting water that deep, just water, yeah. than that grass. That's the warmest water, they found it. They know it's there, and them crappies, most of the time, you can get in there pretty close to them, you're gonna find them crappie. Hmm. That's that's a that's a good little tip, I'm sure. Cause that, you know uh, you can hear them things a long yeah. way. And back when those weeds was in the lake so thick, I would just cut my motor off over there in Old Willisville, and I'd hear that sloshing. I just kept till I get to it, and I'd get out, and that's where I start wading. And that water, like John said, if that sunlight's hitting it, whatever a cypress with vines, and that sun's been hitting it, water's a little warmer. Well, I walk, you know, 50 yards, and this water feels a little cooler over here. It's just you know, but it. You know, it's different. Yeah. Water, you know, water, you know, uh, clarity or whatever, you know, changes. Causes, but yeah. yeah, color and it, it's one or two degrees, and that makes a big difference, I think. It's a lot more to it than just going out there bailing out of a boat. It's just years. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, you hear that just by paying attention to the vines and these all yeah. these different things. That I mean, I, if if I pull up, I see, you know, one cypress is vines on it I go over and fish it now, it's a lot of other stuff around but I, if it don't catch my eye I get back in the boat and I'm gone on I go on I don't you know I just yeah. I fish that one tree or them John's going trees. catching he ain't going yeah, fishing I'm, 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 he, yeah. he's going catching I'm, I'm fin yeah I'm going after him <laughs> <laughs> well this is great I appreciate you guys and, and I'll probably have you on some more podcasts this, this go around and uh, both of you thank you very much make sure you hit that subscribe button and guys, we'll see you the next episode on Crappie Connection. Thank you, Mr. Thank John Thank you, Brad. Mr. Thank John you, Brad. Harrison. Thank you so much. <laughs> Till next time, you got Brad Chapel here. Holla. Out of my front, big muddy river, a place I'll always remember. Cabin on the lake and a fishing pole. Forever here, I'll rest my soul. I can feel.